Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lucky Nagarajan with Deacon America. Welcome to DFI Women in Deep Foundations Committee and Metro New York City Chapter webinar series. We are really thrilled to bring this webinar series, Converting Crisis into Opportunity, Different Perspectives to Everyone. This webinar series is actually aimed to support and connect industry during challenging COVID time. This webinar series is planned twice a month with speakers, panelists from different backgrounds discussing thought-provoking issues. Uh, so keep, keep an eye for these webinars twice a month. I would like to thank the DFI Women in Deep Foundations Committee uh, for this. Uh, special thanks to Karen Armfield with AKRF, Giselle and Joanna from AECOM, Sainthani from Langen, and Arpana from WSP for supporting and organize the, organizing these webinar series with me. So we know Jamie Lee from her presentation last year at one of our Metro New York City Women in Deep Foundations live event at Langen. It was an interactive session where she actually discussed the strategic con conversations on how to lead, influence, and thrive. A little bit about Jamie Lee. She's a certified coach who helps smart men and women who love their jobs but hate office politics. She helps them to get promoted and better paid without throwing anyone under the bus. She's born in South Korea. Jamie first learned resilience from the example of her mother, who single-handedly raised three daughters while running a small business as an immigrant in America. In her former life, she worked as a buyer for multinational companies, as a hedge fund analyst, and later as an operations director for tech startups. As a speaker, she has led workshops for multicultural women's conferences, JP Morgan Chase, Fletcher School of Diplomacy and Law, Institute of Nuclear Power Operators, Association of Corporate Councils, Global Network of Women Peace Builders, and more. Let's welcome our speaker today, Jamie Lee. Thank you so much, Lucky. Thank you, Lucky. Thank you, Carol, Jamie, Connie, and um, so many people who uh, have made this presentation possible. Lucky, I appreciate the introduction. And as she mentioned, this uh, webinar is how to lead with resilience, how we can turn crisis or crises, I should say, we feel like we have multiple uh, right now, um, how to turn them into opportunity for growth. And um, I want to encourage you to consider my definition of what it means to lead. You may have your own personal definition and that's okay. And this is just the definition that I found uh, most resonant and inspiring for me, which is that to lead is to go first without knowing the how. And it's possible that some of you who are joining this call live or in the recording, you are leaders in your community, in your homes, in your workspaces. And we just don't know quite exactly how to come out of this crisis yet. And what if that's okay? Because that is the definition of leading. We don't, we don't know exactly how, but we're gonna go and go figure it out. So what does that entail? That, that requires the ability to decide, to be decisive, right? And creating solutions in the best interest of many people as possible and willingness to fail, willingness to try things out, try out these creative solutions, and you know, being willing to have that solution not work out, but try again, learn, try again, right? So that I feel that really is the definition of leadership. It's not about your position. It's not about how many people report to you. It's not about whether, um, you have the corner office. Well, no one's working from corner offices. We're all working from home, as far as I know, right? So what does it take for you to leave? What does it take for you to go first, even when you don't know the how in these times, right? When um, we're just starting, just starting to come out of the COVID crisis. And um, in, a, in the United States, we are also grappling with the racial injustice crisis as well. And, um, I wanted to ask you, who 
you know, who's listening or watching this presentation, I want to ask you, like, what holds you back from leading in these times? And when you feel held back, what do you do instead? And so um, I want to encourage you to, if you are joining us via the desktop go to webinar, um, to type in your response into the question box. Like, I would love to hear from you. Like, what's holding you back? And when you are held back from taking the leap, taking that risk, making decisions, creating solutions, implementing them, trying them out, like, when you're held back, what do you do instead? Okay, I'll give people a minute to consider the question and type in their responses. If not, we do have a question. Fear okay. of rejection. Fear of rejection. Okay. Rejection, fear of rejection. Beautiful. Very good. Very good. Right. So when you want to lead, right, in this uncertain times, and you encounter the fear of rejection. That's that's perfect, actually. What do you do instead? I mean, feeling the fear of rejection is so human. There's nothing wrong with that. We have a human brain, and the human brain equates the um, the pain of social rejection. Like the human brain makes that more painful than actual physical pain. Right. So what do we do instead? Here's what I want to offer. And here's what I've seen in my own coaching clients. Some of my clients overwork. Some of my clients who, you know, they're all working from home and they realize, oh, it's easy to take calls at 7.30 a.m. because all I have to do is just roll out of bed wearing my pajamas and hop on a call. It's easy to work past 7 p.m. because what else am I going to do? It's easy to work on the weekends because, again, what else am I going to do? But also, uh, people overwork, my clients, you know, they overwork when they're not willing to just be with the discomfort of not working, to be with the discomfort of saying no, right? And, and the reason they fear saying no is because it's that fear of rejection. And some of us, Overconsume. We overconsume social media. We overconsume the news. We overconsume all this information and data. Especially, um, so many people are saying that the times are uncertain, and when our brain feel like, oh, we need certainty, and um, the solution that our brain offers is like, we got to go seek certainty from outside of us, from collecting, from uh, reading and taking in as much information as possible. And I mean, I've caught myself doing this, right? Scrolling through uh, social media feeds and just like feeling overwhelmed and lost and confused because there's so many different and differing opinions about what is going on, what should happen. And so over consuming information is something that happens, but also we can also over consume food or um, alcohol or just, you know, um, I call this buffering when we consume things to, um, to not feel that fear of rejection, not be with that discomfort of taking the lead. And also some people just wait. Let's just wait for, wait and see how things settle. Let's just, you know, sit on our hands and wait for somebody else to take the lead. Yeah. This can happen, but um, I think this happens a lot too. Worrying, worrying about worst case scenarios, worrying about what can go wrong. And all of this can show up in like, you know, uh, mix and match. You might be overworking, maybe you're over consuming, you're also waiting, maybe you're also worrying. Yeah. Uh, and when we feel the fear of rejection, when we feel the fear of, taking the lead and uh, hearing no or or things going wrong and we take 
these actions instead of taking the lead, what can happen is that the net result of this is something that you don't really want, right? The net result of overworking, the net result of overconsuming, waiting, worrying, is that you either burn out emotionally, mentally, physically, or you end up creating what I call self-advocacy debt. Self-advocacy debt is when uh, the gap between what you're truly capable of as a leader, as an influencer, there is a, there's a growing gap between what you're truly capable of, your true potential, and what people perceive what you're capable of, right? And so when this self-advocacy debt grows, you might find out that you've been passed over for promotions or that you're grossly underpaid the going market rate. Some of these things can happen when, um, in general, not just during the crisis, but in general, when you find yourself overworking, overconsuming, waiting for somebody to somebody else to take the lead so that you can feel comfortable to follow and worrying about what can go wrong. So the reason why this happens, and it's okay if this happens, I'm not saying like this is bad, right? This is just like a human reaction to a human emotion, human fear of rejection, right? But why does this happen, right? What is, what is underlying all of this? And um, I think I told you, <laughs> I think I dropped the hint already, but underlying the reason why we overwork, overconsume, wait, worry, even though at the end the net result isn't what we want, is because we're unwilling or we are afraid of how we will feel when we take that risk, when we take that risk to lead, to create solutions, to articulate it, to advocate for it, to implement it, right? We're unwilling to fail. We're unwilling to be disappointed. And something that I'm hearing a lot uh, in general, like when I'm riding the elevator to my apartment, when I'm, you know, I hear people say, oh, I can't take it anymore. I can't handle any more of this. When is this gonna be over? I can't handle it anymore. I don't know if that's something you've said or if that resonates with you. And I find this statement really fascinating because to say that I can't handle it anymore is to see ourselves like this, okay? Is to see ourselves like this, brittle, like as if our capacity to bounce back from hardship is limited. Like we could only take so much. Apologize if, that's, if this is a little hard to read, but this is my rendering, this is my drawing of a broken egg, right? Like some people when they say, oh, I can't handle this anymore, it's as if their capacity to deal with emotion, to deal with disappointment, grief, uh, the fear of rejection, or just the feeling of failure, it's like they only have so much capacity to deal with it, after which they break and then the egg yolk is out and they're no, they're no good anymore, right? So, when you say things like, oh, I can't handle it anymore, it's like as if you're brittle, like your capacity to deal is limited. What if in reality, we're more like this rubber ball, like we're really resilient, we're able to bounce back. I was thinking about the rubber ball, like how you throw the rubber ball against the hard surface and it's going to absorb that momentum, move with it, bounce, and retain the integrity of its shape. It's not gonna break. It's gonna keep moving. And in fact, it's, it's kind of like fun to see a bouncing ball, right? It, it keeps just bouncing off of a hard wall and it still retains its shape. Like, and I thought, what if we can see ourselves as truly resilient as this bouncing ball? We would have to see that we have the capacity, like we have enough capacity and more to deal with how we feel. Because ultimately, 
right? The reason why we overconsume, the reason why we overwork, the reason why we wait, the reason, reason why we worry is because we're trying not to feel a difficult emotion. And, and the thing I want to add here, I know um, many of us are women in this webinar, and we have been told some myths about what it is to be a woman and how to feel. Like we hear that women are emotional and as if that's a problem. And we hear in the workplace, male-dominated workplaces, that to be emotional is a sign of weakness. Right? It's like if you say, Oh, I'm feeling the emotion, I'm feeling emotions, they'll be like, Oh no, what's wrong? Are you okay? What what happened? Or, oh, watch out. <laughs> we don't want you crying or uh, screaming or acting out. There is this deep confusion about what it means to actually feel our own emotions to be okay with it. And so I'm gonna dive deeper into that in a little bit, but for now, I really want to suggest this to you this is a quote this is a quote from lynn twist i don't know if you can read my handwriting i will read it out loud if you can't read it lynn twist is a uh is an activist fundraiser and a money expert lynn twist is somebody who wrote the book called the soul of money and i highly recommend it and the premise the thesis of this book the soul of money is that we have been um program to to see money as a limited resource and we think about money with scarcity mindset and lynn twist is somebody who has worked with mother Teresa. she has worked with like billionaire foundations that are trying to eradicate world hunger i mean she has worked with really really poor people in africa and she has worked with really really rich people in america and all around the world and what she says is that scarcity is a lie what she says is that scarcity is a lie and sufficiency is the truth and what she says about sufficiency was like i, I thought was so appropriate to this topic even though we're talking about emotions because when we think of ourselves as like, oh, we can't, I can't handle this anymore, we see our capacity for resilience as limited, as, as a scarce resource. It's like, we can't handle anymore. Just like, I can't afford that. I'm gonna run out of money, right? It's a very similar mindset. And what she says about sufficiency is that sufficiency is a context that we create within ourselves and in this context, we are reminded that if we look around and within ourselves, we will find what we need. There is always enough, but it's always enough. And so what if we always have enough balance? What if we always ha have enough tensile strength? <laughs> um, some of you are engineers, so you would know more about that than I do, but also what if, you know, what if this really is the truth of who we are and what we're really capable of. We are truly capable of bouncing back. And we have enough resiliency if we just look within ourselves and look around ourselves. What if the truth really is sufficiency, not scarcity, okay? So um, if you have any questions about that, um, I will check in with Lucky and see um, if there are any um, questions. Yeah. Just a, just a second, uh, uh, Jamie, I think I got a question saying that the audio is off. Can everyone else hear Jamie well, or do you have problems hearing Jamie? Oh, everyone can hear well, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. All right, so let's move on. Okay, so the reason why some people are afraid to feel their emotions it's because they are afraid that they will lose control that it will create chaos and i'm here to um, suggest that you consider the opposite what if actually you learning to manage your emotions through these turbulent times is a way for you to own this chaos right you take power over it and also this is an acronym that I will walk you through. And what if we can take power and authority over chaos 
in a way that leads to self-confidence. And self-confidence is when you have the belief that you are capable of dealing with any situation and you find that inner resource, that inner resilience from within yourself, you trust yourself to take action forward towards what you truly want and you have the self-confidence, you have the belief and the confidence in you that you can overcome obstacles and create solutions. So C stands for circumstance, H stands for hand and heart, a stands for aspirations, O stands for obstacles, and S stands for strategy. And if you're taking notes, don't worry, I'm gonna walk you through each and every one of them, starting with C. All right, so, circumstances. Circumstances are what happens in the world, what people say, what we can all observe and agree to be true to be factual, like it's something that we can all agree to be true in the court of law. So what circumstance is not is what we think about the circumstance, is our opinions, our subjective conclusions, descriptions of what happened. And getting to the circumstance, Right, and really being able to define the circumstance in a factual, provable, neutral way is the best way for you to get emotionally in control of any situation, even the most difficult ones. But um, some of the ones, some of the circumstances that come up in my coaching uh, tend to be office politics. <laughs> Okay, so let me give you an example of the difference between a circumstance and our thoughts about it. Circumstance versus thoughts. And I'll explain why this, thinks, this distinction is so important. So I was coaching this client. Uh, this happened before COVID outbreak. She was promoted into a director position. And so, you know, first year into her job, she was doing really well. And after she got promoted, she received an email from a colleague. And she told me the bit of context was that this colleague really wanted that position too. And this colleague wrote and said some words in this email. And she said, hey, you know what? Um, I was going for that position. Those were her words. And my client, she told me that she felt she was being accused. She felt she was being attacked. And she felt like threatened from this email, right? So what, are, what is just the circumstance? What's just the factual, provable, neutral circumstance of this situation? Now, if, you, you know, if you've encountered a similar situation or if you have a situation that you're kind of feeling a little I don't know, stressed out about, like I really encourage you to do something similar as I'm doing, which is just like write down exactly what had happened, what you think about it, and then go back and ask yourself, okay, what's factual, provable, neutral, right? So what's the factual, provable, neutral is that my client got an email from her colleague, right? We can all prove that. We can like show the evidence of the email, right? And it's just neutral. I mean, when you, when you say, okay, I just got an email, it's, it's neither good nor bad, okay? And she said some words. She mentioned in her words, exactly, it was like, hey, I, was, I also wanted that position. Those were her words. So when, it, this is really easy to do when you are not the person who's involved in the situation. When you're the third party, you'd be like, yeah, of course it's neutral. What do you mean? She just got an email. But for my client who was having thoughts about the circumstance, for her, her thoughts were that she was being accused, she was being blamed. And when she believed her thoughts about this neutral circumstance, it created her feelings. Like feeling threatened, for example. Okay. And so let me um, 
and the, the reason why this is important is because even though circumstance, like the email itself is neutral, what we think about it, our interpretation of it, will create our feelings and our feelings will drive our actions. Okay? And this isn't, I'm not saying this because I'm a woman and <laughs> I'm an emotional woman. I'm saying this, this is something that has been uh, observed, proven, and, uh, backed by social scientists, by research, right? Research has shown that emotions are the most important factor in a negotiation conversation. Why? Because it drives our actions, our behavior. And our behavior or our lack of action create our results. Right? Yeah. So, so when my client thinks that she's been threatened, I mean, when she thinks she's been accused, she feels threatened and her actions are to, you know, in her mind, think about all the other times that this colleague said things to her in a way that wasn't nice or, or um, worry that this colleague is going to say things about her uh, out of context to other people, right? And so as a result, when she thinks I'm being accused in her mind, she is, even, even if this result exists only in your mind, this result will always prove the thought to be true. So in my client's mind, she was accusing this particular colleague of threatening her, okay? Um, I will just check in with Lucky here. Is there anything that, people are asking about or things uh, or comments or questions that I'm not seeing? Uh, not really. I think uh, the only one comment I have is from uh, Dennis Brown, who is actually attending this uh, uh, webinar from Australia. So mm -hmm. he said you're a great speaker and a presenter and spot on. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis from Australia. All right. So here's what I want to suggest for you. How can you get neutral about circumstances? It takes effort, it takes practice. Um, coaching helps for sure. But what you can do if you are in what you consider to be a sticky situation because of corona outbreak, because of the protests, right? I invite you to do what I call a download. Just write down everything that is in your brain about the situation. Why is this sticky for you? Why is this difficult for you? Or why is the fear of rejection coming up? Okay. And then I want you to go back and just, just underline what can actually be factual, provable, neutral. Right? Maybe it's that, okay, it is, here's user fact. It is day 101 of uh, corona outbreak in New York State. It's been 101 days, that's a fact, right? And you can choose to think that's terrible or you can choose to think that's great, we're coming out of it, right? So circumstance is always provable. We can have all different types of thoughts about it. So underline just what's factual, provable, neutral, and then notice what different thoughts you have about it, right? Anything that is subjective, uh, anything that is, that is descriptive, anything that is an opinion, right? And just notice, like when I think the thought that it is 101 days and I can't believe it's still not over, how does that make you feel? Does it make you feel brittle or resilient? Or when you think, wow, I'm so proud that I've done this for 101 days, right? I bring it on. I can deal with this, right? You might feel resilient, proud, self-confident. And then imagine like, what are the different actions I take from that? What are different results I can create from that? Okay, so let's talk about hand on heart. The reason why uh, distinguishing between circumstance and thought is so important is because then we can Dis discern what are the thoughts that are creating our emotions. Even the ones that 
feel difficult or or the ones that are pleasant okay and this is something that i learned from my own coach um, th that the hand represents the part of you that takes action that is proactive right the hand is you in action and the heart is the seat of emotion and what would it be like to be connected right the action part of you to the emotion part of you and remember that emotions are simply vibrations in the body emotions are not when you are crying hysterically emotions are not when you are uh, overreacting or over consuming or worrying or yelling or blaming people those are all actions that you take to avoid an action or to you know to react from actions but what i'm suggesting is what if you can just be with right putting your hand on your heart the seat of your emotions and be with the emotion and so what this takes is to be able to identify the cause of the emotion, which is always the thought. And then to be able to locate the vibration in your body, very specifically, where is it? And then to be with it and to, to experience it. Today I was coaching a client who uh, bravely negotiated her salary, even though we're in a crisis and um, her company has said, no one's getting pay raises, but you know, she this was really important to her. So she, um, prepared. She prepared really well for her uh, negotiation. She created um, a case based on the value of her contributions and the future value and the impact of that to the employer. And um, at the end, she was told no. <laughs> they said, this is great, but you know what? No one's getting pay raises. No one's getting promoted. So no. And so she felt disappointed. When she felt disappointed, she wanted to, you know, think about like what she's going to do to get away from the disappointment, to not feel the disappointment. She wanted to avoid conversations with her employer. She wanted to, you know, leave. <laughs> and so I challenged her. I said, what if we can just be with the disappointment for a minute, for a minute? And being with the disappointment is not being in your mind thinking about, oh, what do I got to do to not feel this disappointment? It's literally closing your eyes for a minute, checking in with your body, like dropping into the body and locating, locating where is this disappointment? And, and she said, okay, this disappointment is in my heart. I feel it's heavy. It's dark. Okay. So what if it's okay? What if it's not a problem to just feel this vibration in the heart, the, the dark, the black, heavy sensation. Let's just be with it. What if it's supposed to be there? Yeah, what if it's not a problem? And then what happened is that just within a minute of just being with this emotion, she sensed a shift. The emotion was shifting, it was moving in her body. And she said, okay, now it's in my gut. And now it's like, I'm, be, I'm digesting it and it's processing, right? So notice how being with an emotion, like I said, not crying, not reacting, not like yelling, screaming, throwing a fit. It's literally just sitting and experiencing what is happening inside your body. and and she was okay. And what if it's okay for you too? I know right now um, there is grief in the world. There is sadness, there is anger, there is disappointment, there is even shame. And these are some emotions that people are not used to feeling, people are not used to processing, right? And so when we try not to be with it, that's when we resort to you know, overworking, over-consuming, worrying, waiting, right, which does not create the results that we want. But I wanna suggest, what if you can just take a minute a day, a minute a day to put your hand on your heart and be with whatever difficult emotion comes up in the journey of your leadership. I mean, I, I do this myself. I, I, 
I take 30 minutes, <laughs> but you can just start with one minute. And you can tell yourself, of course I feel this way. Of course I feel sad. Of course I feel grief. Of course I feel angry. Of course I feel disappointed because of the thought I have in my brain. And by the way, the thought you have in your brain is just the sentence in your head. And you are not your thought. It's just a sentence. And sometimes our brains will offer us uh, pretty awful sentences. Like, who do you think you are? You're not good enough. You didn't do enough. You did it wrong. People don't value you, right? These are, these are default thinking that comes from what I call the primitive brain or the itty bitty shooty committee. And so by default, it's no surprise that we feel insufficient. We feel inadequate. We feel worried, right? It's not a problem. But what if we can just acknowledge that we have a primitive brain that is afraid of um, risk, that is afraid of changing the status quo, right? Some people are just anxious that now oh, we're kind of used to quarantine, now it's gonna end, that's creating anxiety because the status quo is changing. And the point I'm trying to make is, what if it's okay? What if it's not a problem? What if you can be compassionate with yourself and say, of course I feel anxious because I'm afraid of change. I'm afraid of what's gonna happen, yeah? And if you can be with compassion with yourself, you can also extend that compassion and understanding to others. And being empathetic as a leader is a, is a very um, highly admirable and um, desired trait. Okay, so from there, like take a moment to put your hand on your heart, to identify the emotion, to locate it, to be with it, to breathe through it, right? It's not a problem. If you feel disappointed, sad, grief, anger, shame, what well, it's not a problem, if you can be with it, then what you will notice is that the negative emotions are uh, no longer a problem. Like you can deal with it. And also they go, uh, they go, they get processed through your body faster. Okay. So it becomes a less of a problem. Isn't that ironic? When you're willing to be with a negative emotion, it becomes less of a problem. From there, what do we do? Okay. So now we're getting into the heart of the chaos, right? We did C, circumstance, H, hand on heart, A, aspirations. Once we have processed our emotions, just one minute body scan, right? Then from there, I want to invite you to really spend time with your future aspirations. What do you want for you? What do you want the future you to be, to have, to experience? Right? And this is something that I, I do myself all the time. Right? I just journal, I just sit down and I just create this prompt of like, this is what I want for me. This is what I want for my future. And then I just keep writing. I want, I want to buy new clothes for the summer. I want to um, make an impact as a speaker, as a coach. I want to help women. I want to help close the gender wage gap, the racial gap. I want to be bigger than uh, you know what the itty bitty shooty committee is whispering in my brain. I want to be bigger than that. I want to grow beyond my own self limitations, right? Or I I just want to get up and go. I want to lead. I want to show up. I want to be an example of what is possible. So I really encourage you to take some time to brainstorm all the things that you want for you not because people tell you that you should want but really genuinely comes from the seed of your desire like you you would know that you truly want it because that feeling of desi desire would be in your body okay and also when you think about your aspirations for the future sometimes it helps to think about okay what have i done in the past what are the accomplishments of my past self yeah and I know we are accomplished engineers, managers, um, 
technical experts, uh, salespeople, right? So you have all accomplished something that you at one point thought, oh my God, I can't do that. You know, for one of my uh, clients, it was uh, in the last financial crisis, she changed her job, changed her apartment, and found the love of her life. And before she did all of that, she's like, none of that is possible. I think it's impossible that I get a new job, a new apartment, meet my husband, right? But when she, on, on the other side, now when she looks back, she's like, wow, wow. I have the capacity to completely change my life. I have the capacity to be so resilient in the face of difficult circumstances, right? And so if you're capable of doing that, and for some of you, that's just, it might be just um, uh, that you're a mother, that you gave birth, right? Or, or you immigrated like I did to a new country. Right? You've done things in the past. And when you, when you consider the accomplishments, you're like, wow, I was really resilient. That's who you are. That's what you're capable of. And if that is the case, what is your future self capable of? And I know right now, it might feel like this thing that we're going through is never going to end. The uncertainty is never going to end. But, but what if we can direct our brain to think about who we want to be on the other side of this crisis? Do we want to come out of it more resilient, more confident, a better speaker, uh, somebody who knows her values better, somebody who is really sure on what is the most important things in her, what in her life are. Okay? So you get to envision your future self and just really um, take some time to take your brain there and ask yourself, what is my future self thinking? What is she doing? How is she feeling? And what advice would my future self give me now? The person who comes out of this crisis better, stronger, and more resilient, what might she tell me now to stop doing or to start doing and for me when i think about my future self my future self is just keep on keep on keeping on keep going you're doing great give yourself more credit because you don't do that enough give yourself more credit for how much you are showing up and just keep on keeping on so i'm i want to just take a moment and ask uh the attendees like when you think about what you want for your future, and when you think about the accomplishments of your past self and what your future self is capable of, do you have any new insights or does something come up for you? And I'll check in with Lucky. I don't know if yeah um give a minute or so i think as soon as the comments come in i can i can get back to you okay great oh that is one comment mm -hmm. uh i definitely this is from Lori simpson she is from uh, california um i definitely achieve more when i take time to figure out what i want and take time to plan for it yes beautiful and that's i'm so glad you shared that because Planning requires us to use our prefrontal cortex. You know, I just talked about the primitive brain or the itty bitty shooty committee that, you know, that's always going to, you know, um, create doubt or, or fear of change. Whereas the prefrontal cortex is the more evolved part of us. It is the most human part of us. And so when you plan ahead, right, you're using your prefrontal cortex. And so what you do is as when you plan, you're the past self who is setting up your future self up for success by using the most evolved part of our brain. So I love that, love that. And that, that is the perfect segue to the next step in this process, right? Once we have uh, distinguished circumstances from thoughts, once we have uh, checked in with our body and allowed emotions, right? Processed our emotions by putting our hand on our heart. And once we have connected with what we truly want for the future, then 
we come back to the present moment. Then we come back to what are the obstacles in this current moment. Remember, my definition of leadership is going first without knowing the how. And that requires creating solutions, whether that is coming up with a new way to engage people, uh, a new way to communicate uh, plans for the post-COVID world, whether that's a new way to complete your projects or a new way to um, advance your career, right? You're gonna have to come up with some solutions. But before you do that, what you do is, okay, let's consider what is in the way. What do you see as barriers or obstacles to you achieving the goal uh, that is in alignment with the desires of your future self or desires of your current self, like what your future self has already achieved, right? And then from there, we consider it from the perspective of the person who's already overcome it. Like if your future self has already overcome this obstacle, what advice might she give you? And from there, you create strategies and solutions. And I think what's really important in doing this is constraining our focus. Um, the reason why I say that is because when we think about obstacles to achieving what we want, it's so easy, especially in the workplace context, to think about what other people will need to say and do and feel. And we feel like we need so-and-so to approve my ask, and we need so-and-so to not throw me under the bus, we need so-and-so to put a stamp of approval on this so that I can feel confident, so that I can move forward. But, but that's not in our control, right? So we have to constrain our obstacles and strategies to what is in our control, which is how we think, how we feel, what we do, and as a result, the, res and the results that we create from that, right? So we wanna constrain our focus to what is in our lane, in my control. And from there, you wanna decide Right? Decide, I am going to take the perspective of my future self. Let me give you uh, uh, some examples from my own coaching practice. I just coached this client who unfortunately got laid off uh, from her uh, logistics company. And, and um, you know, she had some obstacles to overcome, uh, some immediate obstacles of how would she manage, how would she communicate her transition, um, how is she going to plan for her next phase? How is she going to reinvent her career, right? And from her current perspective, her current thoughts were like, well, this wasn't fair, it was terrible, I don't know what to do. And um, yeah, I just feel annoyed at this whole thing, right? And when she was feeling annoyed, it wasn't really leading to creative solutions or strategies for her to confidently move forward into the next phase of her career. And so, you know, we, we just did the same process that I walked you through, separating circumstances from thoughts. And what's real and what are thoughts? And then what are the emotions that are coming up? The disappointment, the anger, the frustration, the grief of losing her job. Okay, so once we have moved through that grief, how can we reconnect with our aspirations? What does she want for her future? And in the future, she is a thought leader. She is somebody who is behind a podium, somebody who is inspiring young people into their greatness, right? And so when she took this perspective of her future self, she realized, oh, okay, well, you know, actually, what's happened right now is a silver lining. This is, this is exactly the push that I needed to step forward into my greatness, step forward into the next phase to what I really wanted to do. And so she realized, okay, obstacles, I have strategies. Just move on, right? Move on, deal with it, make plans, reach out to people, set up some calls and have some conversations about what I wanna do from now on, okay? Uh, let me give you one more example. 
Um, I had a client who was um, having a difficult conversation with her employer. And when she was thinking about this conversation from the context of employee manager relationship, she realized that she was just like, yeah, manager is somebody that I go to to um, complain, <laughs> to tell them what's not working. And so when she was thinking about it in that context, she felt frustrated, kind of annoyed, like she she felt like very defensive. And so she all she was thinking of was like, how do I just rebut whatever objection they bring up in this conversation? And it wasn't creating a very, um, it, 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 the way she was thinking about it was not going to be very conducive to a mutual win-win conversation. So I challenged her to think about, okay, what do you really want in the future? What is your future aspiration? Her future aspiration is to be an entrepreneur in the long run, to run her own business. Okay, so then how can you think about the obstacles, you know, the manager's objections from the perspective of a CEO? Like, what if you were coming to this conversation as if you were pitching a potential client as the CEO of your consulting company? And she's like, oh, actually, when I think about it that way, then I know exactly what to do. I know how to pitch a client on the value of my services so I can have a conversation that's value-driven, right? And so she, Again, constrain her focus to what is in her control, which is her response, how she frames the conversation. And then she decided to show up like a CEO, like somebody who is a leader already. And that conversation went really well. Okay, so these are some strategies that you can implement. And um, I help my clients apply this framework to their conversations at work, to their career planning. Um, and to summarize, so let's just put it all together, okay? Circumstances don't create our emotions. The way people in the world think and talk about things might have you believe that, oh, because so-and-so said things, I'm disappointed because of COVID, I'm devastated or I'm annoyed, right? But what if it's not true? Circumstances are neutral and we can just define that circumstance in a very neutral, factual way. We can, we can get to a place where like, we're not feeling bad or good, right? But it's our thoughts. Thoughts, which are just sentences in our minds and our thoughts, we are not our thoughts, right? You have choice over your thoughts. But our thoughts, even the ones that we don't intend to have, create emotion, and we can be with our emotions. We can put our hand on our heart, we can be compassionate with our own emotions, right? And this will help us deal with the stress of our times. It just imagine you took one minute a day, just be with a difficult emotion, and just checked in, dropped into your body, located it, identified it, experienced it, and let it pass, right? There would be so much more peace and power that you bring back to you. And then from there, we focus on what do we want in the future? What do we want for ourselves genuinely that creates desire, power, and motivation to plan ahead, to use the most evolved part of us? And then from there, we... Um, identify obstacles and strategies or solutions and implement them and move forward. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you enjoyed this content, I have uh, three open slots available for a free 60 minute consultation. Uh, this week, and I, you know, I'll have some more spots available next week. If you want to have a chat, or if you want to see this action and you want to see it in action for you and you're curious about it, I welcome you to write me. My email is, can you read it? Jamie at jamieleecoach.com. Um, and I will, um, I will be more than happy to set up a time individually to have a chat with you one-on-one -on -one complimentary. 
for up to 60 minutes. Um, I want to check in with Lucky and see if there are any other questions, comments before we wrap up. Yes, Jamie, um, one question is, how do you address lack of confidence in this how do we? This is beautiful. Thanks so much for that question. How do you address lack of confidence? So confidence comes from um, competence. Like you have confidence when you know that you can do something, right? But in these times, we have to come up with new solutions new strategies and so this is the time that requires self-confidence like in you believing in you and so we have to get to the reason why you don't have confidence is the reason why you don't have confidence be, uh, because you haven't done something or is it because of what you are thinking and believing about you when it comes to taking a very specific action. And it could be both or it could be either or, right? And if it's you not have you just not knowing how to do it, that's okay. Of course you don't have confidence. We, you just haven't done it yet. And so now it's time for you to create courage, right? Courage is feeling the fear, is doing it anyways. And when you do it anyways, that's how you feel capacity to do something, right? And when you have the capacity to do something, then from there, you will build your confidence. But if you're not feeling confident because of what you're thinking and believing about you, and this, you know, this is just normal, right? Then we can identify that thought and then you can, you can um, observe it and then you can decide, okay, what do I want to think and feel? about this. How do I want to think and feel in a way that will create courage, that will create belief in me? And this is the work that I do with my clients every day. So I welcome you to um, reach out for a consultation. We'll be, I'll be happy to help you through that. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so I think uh, Dennis Brown from Australia is going to reach out to you. Mm -hmm. um, please thank you for the wonderful offer and uh, he will be reaching out to you. Amazing. I'm looking forward to it. So mm -hmm. uh, Jamie at jamieleecoach.com. And again, remember, this chaos is something that you can manage. We can all manage. We can all be that bouncing ball. <laughs> we all have more resilience then we give ourselves credit for. Imagine that um, our resilience never really runs out. We can always bounce back. Thank you. Right. That is so true. That is so true. I think this can be used in any any time of our life. I don't Thank think it's you. just this. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. Think, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to see you again and have you uh, again for the Metro New York City group. You're most welcome. Thank you so much for the privilege of addressing your group. And again, if anyone has questions, you can reach me here. And I wish everyone the best. Thank you. So before we leave, I just want to bring in what we have for the next webinar series. Um, so next webinar series is going to be scheduled on June 24th, uh, Wednesday, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the speaker is going to be Dr. Bernali Ghosh. Um, she, is, she is a technical director at Mark McDonald from UK. Um, and uh, she is going to be talking about why a seismic engineer never stands still, gender bias and global experience. I look forward to having you all on the next webinar, next webinar series. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.